As you perhaps have uh, already heard, I will talk ab uh, about uh, Hans Jonas and Whitehead, the concept of organism. And several authors in the tradition of continental philosophy in the 20th century focus on the concept of life in order to overcome the dualism of matter and mind, which first has been developed by Descartes. Henri Bergson, who has already been mentioned, Max Scheler, Helmut Klessner, Nikolai Hartmann, Hedwig Konrad Martius, Albert Schweitzer, and Hans Jonas are only the most prominent. Whitehead also owes the fundamental concept of process philosophy, the concept of organism, to continental philosophy, and there especially um, from, Whitehead, uh, from Plato. In process and reality, it is applied to inorganic and organic entities, whereas in Nature and Life, published in 1934, the main features of animate being are elaborated. Nevertheless, Hans Jonas, who was familiar with Whitehead's ontology of nature, whose, as he admits, intellectual power and philosophical significance cannot be compared with any further philosophy of our days, criticizes that Whitehead does not characterize the phenomenon of life adequately. Just in interpreting already the concept of matter by means of vitalistic terms, Whitehead, so Jonas, is unable to take into account the existential and ethical meaning of life and death for any animate being. The transition from animate being um, to, uh, from inanimate being to animate being, so Jonas, implies an ontological revolution. Only in respect to animate being, it makes sense to apply the concept of inwardness of subjectivity in a very broad sense. And then an organism does not only become and fade away, the sensitivity for its inner condition includes, induces its will to live and consequently the emotion of deep fear in the confrontation with death. Also the problem of ethical evil and not only of metaphysical evil, we have mentioned yesterday, gains a completely new dimension. On the background of this critic, I will take the concept of organism, which both authors share, as guide for the analysis of the phenomenon of life and discuss what they have in common and in how, how far they differ. First, I will talk of the revised concept of organism as I have said, both authors share. The center of Whitehead's philosophy of nature and of Jonas' philosophical biology is a revised concept of organism. As in antiquity, an organism is a whole which combines mental and physical components. Yet, on the background of the theory of evolution, the whole evolves by means of a permanent process of self-transcendence. For both authors, animate beings cannot be conceived as substances in the Aristotelian sense, existing independently of relations to the world. Already the metabolism as a necessary condition of biological self-preservation implies a ceaseless process of self-transcendence. Consequently, an organism <clears throat> is not accidentally, but essentially, constituted by its relation to otherness. The relations that tie an organism to the world are by no means abstract, but concrete. They rely on a very specific environment that is able to satisfy the needs of an organism. Beyond this, the relations are not prefabricated and fixed. They are continuously constituted by the activity of an organism and in so far part of the process of life itself. An organism has on the one hand the capability to refer to the world by its own dynamics and is on the other hand dependent on the world. Therefore, as Jonas and Whitehead argue, the dynamics of an organism is not completely determined by causally acting factors, but also by goal-oriented actions. 
The capability to self-motion is a crucial expression of liveliness and implies, even on its lowest level, a first form of freedom from the determinants of the environment. Yet, for Whitehead, all entities, animate as well as inanimate, are related to the surrounding by their own activity. But, if so, what makes the difference between inorganic and organic forms of self-organization? For Jonas, the relations to the environment due to the self-transcendence of animate being must be shaped fundamentally different. They are not only the trace of spontaneous self-causation that enables the emergence of discrete elementary particles as electrons and protons. In living beings, self-transcendence is the expression of inwardness, of at least a minimal degree of the sensitivity for one's own state of subjectivity. And therefore, life and death are no longer equivalent. And the acts of self-transcendence and the relations to the environment imply at least rudimentary forms of judgment. They are meaningful for the survival of an organism whose activity is steered by the will to live. Consequently, also the environment with its broad spectrum of options which may foster or destroy the process of life is no longer perceived as indifferent. Without any doubt, spontaneous activity is the basis for the emergence of form, as Whitehead rightly observes. Yet, it is not sufficient for the evolution of inwardness and implies a boundary between the inner world and the environment. Boundary means, as especially Plessner has stressed, separation and bonding at once. This observation is confirmed also under the perspective of modern biology. The cell, as a basic unity of life, is separated by a membrane from the surrounding. It is the first entity that is endowed with a sensitivity for stimuli. Inwardness, therefore, cannot be reduced to chemical reactions and biological functions. Only because a living organism feels the difference between itself and the world, it can adapt to its environment in order to survive. In getting into touch with the world, it feels both the world and itself. Without the opening to the world, it could not have a relation to itself. And without the sensitivity for itself, it could not perceive the world. Therefore, in living entities, three forms of causation have to be distinguished. Causality, and biological functionality, and finally, rudimentary forms of intentionality, which are the outcome of qualified perceptions and their meaning for an organism that struggles for life. That means life is meaningful for the organism itself. It has an intrinsic goal. Though, as Whitehead argues rightly, already inanimate entities have to be characterized by self-causation that allows self-organization and functional processes of feedback, the dynamics of animate beings is based on the interaction of three forms of causality. Inwardness therefore transforms the concept of an organism as a whole. In contrast to inanimate objects, it has, as Jonas stresses, inner identity. It is the origin for the striving for self-preservation by means of the twofold dynamics of self-limitation and self-transcendence. Inner identity implies the capability to feel the difference of life and death and causes the will to live, as I have already said. Being and not being are no longer equivalent. Therefore, living entities do not simply transform themselves by the continuous perception of always new impulses. They struggle against their fading away and try to preserve the continuity of this inner identity. However, Jonas does not interpret the inner identity and its permanence by the means of the ontology of substance, but a ceaseless act 
life is activity. An activity that implies the sensitivity for this identity. At least rudimentary forms of consciousness are the decisive motivation for the striving for self-preservation. For living entities, the striving for completion and fulfillment, stressed by Whitehead for all entities, therefore becomes indeed a new dimension. Fading away is ex ex existentially felt as death and annihilation, which causes suffering, agony, and sorrow. Consciousness is not a neutral fact, but is felt as inherent value and as precious goal. An organism strives to preserve its inner identity not only for an ephemeral moment of completion, but as long as possible. He is striving for consciousness. Due to this intrinsic goal, the destruction of organisms by self-conscious beings as humans has to be interpreted ethically as the manifestation of thoughtlessness, of brute force, or even of an act of bad faith. For Whitehead and Jonas, an organism is not embedded in relations that are predetermined. The organism himself has to generate the relations by its own activity. Therefore, it is bound to the environment by eternal relations as expression of qualified perceptions and needs and by external relations constituted by the overlapping of its own activities and the activities of other creatures and inorganic processes. It is an integral part of the environment on which it depends and which it is at the same time and which is at the same time shaped by its activity. On the one hand, relations are an expression of its goal-oriented activity, of physiological functions as well as of qualified perceptions and needs. On the other hand, the organism has to relate to the environmental conditions which restrict and determine its activities and the range of options. Again, causality, functionality and intentionality are intertwined in the process of self-constitution and self-preservation. Nevertheless, Whitehead and Jonas distinguish only causality and spontaneity without differentiating explicitly, explicitly between the functional aspect of physiological dynamics and the goal-oriented dimension due to qualified perceptions and a specific form of subjectivity. Consequently, the physiologically induced form of self-organization as a basis of metabolism is not sufficiently distinguished from the striving for being emerging from the will to live and at least rudimentary forms of consciousness. As Kassira, also Whitehead and Jonas submit the clear separation of the knowing subject and the known object that was characteristic for the Cartesian type of epistemology. Neither does the organism constitute reality, nor can it be perceived in itself. An organism perceives the world by means of the relation it constitutes in the process of self-transcendence. Yet it perceives something that exists independently of its own activity and which is steered by its own dynamics. Therefore, the concept of organism implies the entanglement of subject and object in the act of perception and self-constitution. And the organism perceives, in contrast, contrast to the assumptions of the empirical sciences, not only objects, and the perspective of the third person, but also feelings, emotions, ethical, aesthetic, and even religious aspects of the inner and the outer world. Organisms are, <coughs> Whitehead and Jonas agree, essentially unique. Due to the process of self-transcendence, they are tied to a very specific position in space and time. The ever new synthesis of perceptions and experiences shapes the unique history of an organism. Yet, as we have argued, not brute and neutral facts are perceived, but qualified and meaningful events. 
These are not stored chronologically in the memory of an organism, but due to their relevance, as Henri Bergson has argued in his analysis of the relation between time and memory. And because every organism expresses its inner life physically, an organism is unique in physical and mental respect. Life, as Jonas said, says, is self-centered individuality. Yet whereas Whitehead focuses on the self-constitution of a unique organism, Jonas again concentrates on the self-centeredness of the feeling and knowing self. The physical, as well as the mental activity of an organism, transforms its living conditions steadily and irreversibly. Therefore, it is impossible, as especially Whitehead argues in Function of Reason, that the order of nature remains constant. Organism and environment transform each other ceaseless, ceaselessly. Consequently, both are joined in a process of co-evolution. On the one hand, this process is the basis for the evolution of new forms and the emergence of higher mental and physical complexity. On the other hand, entities become extinct. If the discrepancy between the challenges of the environment and their own strategies can no longer be bridged. As Whitehead and Jonas argue, uh, uh, as Whitehead also Jonas argues for the co evolution of consciousness and freedom, inwardness stretches from rudimentary forms of sensitivity to the human form of self consciousness. Therefore, even humans are related to the simplest form of living entities. And these reciprocally have at least to a minimal degree the potential to develop the higher physical and mental properties we know from ourselves. In the meantime, <clears throat> a lot of empirical observations have demonstrated that even plants are by no means simple machines reacting automatically on stimuli. They can discriminate different stimuli and adapt their strategies, and they are at least to a certain degree even able to anticipate events. And the simplest animals are already able to learn by experience. The evolution of consciousness implies an enormous spectrum of mental activities and the modes of behavior. Dependent on the form of consciousness, also the freedom to recognize alternatives and to choose between different options increases. Whereas Jonas focuses on the Aristotelian classification of plants, animals, and humans, whose properties he analyzes, Whitehead distinguishes six levels of existence, humans, animals, and plants, the single living cell, big inorganic aggregates, and atomic events. But none of the two authors discusses a fourth section of living entities, mushrooms and lesion, that constitute a peculiar branch in the tree of evolution and cannot be classified as plants. Nevertheless, both agree that the scope of behavior and the degree of physical and mental centering is the main characteristic for the differentiation between the levels. And because an organism is conceived as a whole that is constituted by the dynamic interaction of its parts, the process of evolution proceeds in spite of the continuity of most of its elements discontinuously. A new synthesis of nearly the same elements to a whole leads suddenly in a sort of jump to a qualitatively new form of life and possibly even to a higher degree of consciousness. Yet only Whitehead, who conceives already atomic particles as bipolar, can avoid the bisection of nature in animate and inanimate entities. Without introducing new principles, he can indeed encompass the whole range of nature. Only under these premises, intentional forms of activity 
can influence material processes. Mental forms of activity do not interfere with mindless matter, but complex organic structures influence the basic elements. Nonetheless, as Whitehead argues, the concept of self-causation attains on every level of being a new and more complex function. The interplay of matter and mind, of causality, functional and purposeful, goal-oriented forms of activity is transformed on every level of being. Also for Whitehead, only living entities are endowed with a sensitivity for qualified perceptions and dull feelings, and only humans make use of abstract symbols and can recognize themselves and the world rationally and judge ethically. Consequently, also the concept of freedom obtains an ever new meaning on every level of being. And though humans have at least on this planet the most complex form of consciousness, their, their life depends on the restless activity of a great variety of completely unimpressive organisms and inorganic processes. In respect to their body and mind, humans are an integral part in the web of life that is constituted by the interplay of organisms which are altogether bipolar. Yet, and despite the agreement in respect to the mutual influence of mental and physical aspects in living entities, we have to take into account a remarkable difference in terminology. Whereas Whitehead overcomes the dualism of body and mind already for inorganic ever events, Jonas overcomes it only in respect to living entities. The process of life is a manifestation of the whole organism, of physical and mental activities, of inwardness and of physiological functions. Therefore, it cannot be reduced to natural science and its methodology. Nevertheless, both authors do not argue for the correlation of mental and physical properties and that means for the dualism of properties in German, Eigenschaftsdualismus. Mental and physical processes cannot be compared with the two sides of one coin that are not intertwined. Instead, the concept of organism implies the interpenetration and mutual interference of physical and mental processes. The mental state of an organism, Whitehead argues explicitly, influences the motion even of the atomic particles. Recent research projects in epigenetic have proven that the way of life, its preferences in respect to nutrition, existential experiences, and deep emotions, influence the activation and deactivation of genes. And these patterns of activation and deactivation can even be inherited. Beyond the interaction of mental and physical aspects in every individual, the climatic change, which is discussed at this conference especially, implies the demand to rethink also the interaction of nature and culture. Yet though both, both authors agree in respect to the interaction of mental and physical processes in an organism, they differ again in respect to the range of application. Whitehead makes use of the concept of bipolarity for inorganic and organic processes, whereas Jonas, who has stressed the meaning of inwardness for living entities, distinguishes the physical and the lived body, in German, Körper and Leib. This differentiation has been developed in phenomenology, especially by Edmund Husserl, Edith Stein, Helmut Plessner, Max Scheler, and the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Yet the difference in terminology of Jonas and Whitehead again is a hint to the difference in the concept of organism. The lived body is in its physiological functions penetrated by subjectivity. The inner identity, a genuine characteristic of living entities, is expressed bodily. Both mental activities 
and the lived body are part of the unique history of an animate being. Due to the lack of inwardness, the concept of the lived body cannot be applied to inorganic entities. This leads us to another differentiation. If a living organism is a unity of body and mind, another concept comes to the fore. Every living entity expresses its inner life, its feelings, emotions, and its needs visibly in its bodily appearance by gestures, gestures, gaze, and facial expression. The expression of subjectivity is therefore an essential characteristic of all living entities, as Jonas argues, in accordance with Scheler, Kassira, and Plessner. Yet also Whitehead makes use of the concept of expression and argues that qualified perceptions and feelings are not enclosed in a sort of black box in the brain and perceived only under the perspective of the first person. The bodily appearance of an organism, organism represents feelings, intentions, and meaning. They can be perceived by others and even reach beyond the body and its brain and shape the quality of the space surrounding an organism. The bodily expression of inner life is a necessary condition for the communication between individuals of the same species and between different species. The human language is only a very special form of expression grounded on abstract symbols. Nevertheless, Whitehead again does not restrict the range of the concept of expression to living entities that have at least a rudimentary form of inwardness and sensitivity for themselves and the world. In order to embrace the whole nature, he conceives every region that is the field of expression as alive. Especially Scheler and Kassira would agree with Whitehead in so far as a process of nature <coughs> has a meaning for the observer. The landscape, for example, can obtain a sort of physiognomic expression for the observer, as Kassira argues. It may seem to be friendly or threatening. However, Scheler and Kassira would not agree that the environment itself, especially in its inorganic structures, has an expression and is therefore alive. As for Jonas, the concept of expression implies inwardness and it means a lived body. Therefore, only nature as an interplay of living entities can be expressive. Due to the interpenetration of mental and physical aspects in every living organism, nature is not determined by the external causal interaction of objects in space. It is shaped by the dynamic interaction of a multitude of living entities and their expression of inwardness. Each of them has an intrinsic goal which, is, which it pursues by its own activity. Due to the expression of their needs and emotion, emotions, they transcend themselves not only in spatial but also in temporal respect. At least to a certain degree, the spatial and temporal order of nature is constituted by the activity of living entities. That, and that means it is not only a geometrical frame for activities. The temporal order has several dimensions. First of all, the living organism itself has a temporal orientation that extends from past to future. Though the behavior of a living organism is to a certain degree determined by past experiences, it transcends them at the same time by striving for the fulfillment of its needs and interests, as Whitehead observes. Hand in hand with a growing consciousness for temporal relations, the scope of action widens, as Jonas argues. The manner how plants, animals, and humans strive for the fulfillment of their needs depends fundamentally on their capability to perceive temporal dimensions. This capability is correlated with their physiology, sense organs, and nerve system, 
beyond this with emotions and the freedom to move in space. Secondly, due to the process of self-transcendence, the temporal dynamics of every organism leads to the temporal interweaving of the life cycles of all living entities in the ecosystem and finally in the biosphere. The relations that tie an organism to its environment have to be correlated with the activities of all living entities and even beyond this with the dynamic of inorganic processes in the, in the surrounding, for example with rain and sunshine. In brief, the order of nature is spatio-temporal and it is constituted to a high degree by the activity of a multitude of organisms. Thirdly, <clears throat> by the temporal dynamics of every organism and their interplay, the three dimensions of time, past, present and future, are again and again combined and generate the memory of nature. Remembrance is far more than the autobiographical memory of the human individual that St. Augustine, Locke, Bergson and Peter Singer discuss. Due to the bipolar structure of every organism, as unity of body and mind, the physical dimension of every entity is part of its unique history, even if this cannot be remembered consciously. And due to the process of self-transcendence of every organism and the spatial-temporal relatedness to fellow creatures and inorganic substances, a sort of memory of the whole nature emerges. It is not only constituted by past events that act causally. Due to the inwardness of living entities, it implies also their memory that steers their emotions and their behavior spontaneously. Hand in hand with the growing physical and mental complexity of an organism, Jonas and Whited agree the scope of action increases. Hand in hand with the capability to learn, to solve problems, and to distinguish new aspects, the independence of the determinants of the environment and the power of tradition decreases. Actions become more and more the expression of real spontaneity and that means of freedom, as Whitehead and Jonas argue. Yet, Whitehead again extends the range of the concept of freedom to inorganic processes. It has the function to describe all forms of self-causation in nature. And again, we can spell out the critic of Jonas that Whitehead blurs the ontological difference between inorganic and living entities. For Whitehead, every organism is due to the capability to self-causation alive and even responsible for its, its decisions. Consequently, only those entities are defined as dead that are determined completely by external causation and past events. In contrast to Whitehead, Jonas argues that freedom implies at least a trace of inwardness as a motivation to strive for self-preservation. Only then the behavior can be directed intentionally against the physical forces of the environment. And only if decisions can be reflected consciously, an organism is responsible in ethical respect. Though on the lowest level of sensitivity, the activity of an organism is, restra is restrained to sheer biological self-preservation, it cannot be reduced to biological functions because the needs are felt as a must. Jonas describes the relation of an organism to its environment as a relation of needy freedom. Yet both authors agree that the survival requires the capability to differentiate between options and to direct its attention to one of them and to choose it. Only if the attention is not scattered by the multitude of stimuli, the environment comprises but focused on the object with the greatest relevance for the very specific needs of an organism, harmful and useful things can be distinguished. Already this first form of attention is not caused by stimuli, but also, by, by, uh, also directed by the meaning 
of an object for the life of an organism. In focusing on a particular object, the freedom from the influence of other stimuli increases and the selected object can be perceived more clearly. <coughs> a process of feedback emerges. The greater the freedom from the reaction to stimuli, the greater the capability to direct the attention to a single object and to explore it even playfully due to a first <coughs> awakening of curiosity. Yet, not only the mental capabilities increase, the constitution of the whole organism, sense organs, nerve <coughs> system, and the brain become more complex. And hand in hand with the organic evolution, the psychic capacities increase. To the capability to remember one's experiences and to learn by them, the sense of self, of self raises and the perception of desire and pain becomes more intensely. The evolution of consciousness and the evolution of freedom um, are intertwined with one another. <coughs> and the individuality of an organism, and that means also of its, spe of its special biography, becomes more and more important for the behavior and the social relations to fellow creatures. Beyond this, the capability to perceive temporal relations, as I've, I have already mentioned, evolves together with the capability to remember perceptions and experiences. An organism must no longer react immediately to its needs. It can learn by experiences and is able to anticipate different options. It can renounce to an object that can easier be attained and choose one that promises a higher degree of satisfaction. The capability to perceive an object in a spatial distance implies the capability to bridge temporal distances. Emotions now, have, now imply the decisive motivation that pushes an organism forward and allows him to overcome long distance, distances of space and time. Yet, together with the growing capability to steer one's own actions, the risk to fail also increases. Nevertheless, the sensitivity for risk and the will to live comprises again the germ for growing forms of consciousness. Freedom, therefore, is correlated to the consciousness of the world and to the feeling of self. Though without any doubt, perception, feeling and consciousness have an indispensable function for survival, neither for Jonas nor for Whitehead they can be reduced to this function. Perception, feeling and especially consciousness determine the quality and intensity of life an organism strives for. They have an intrinsic value for the process of life. Due to the co-evolution of freedom and consciousness, not only humans, but all living entities have already an intrinsic aim. Consequently, humans have ethical duties, not only towards fellow humans, but also have to respect the intrinsic value, the dignity of creatures, and of the biosphere as a common living space. Jonas <coughs> writes explicitly, the biological and mental affinity of all creatures, humans included, is a great opportunity to give back an intrinsic value to the whole range of life. It was lost as consequence of Cartesian dualism and on the background of the methodology of natural science and its claim to explain all physical processes. This leads to another important step in the argumentation of Whitehead and Jonas. If ethical values are not mere constructions, but at least to a certain degree grounded in nature itself, human actions cannot only be based on interests, on rational arguments and the striving for consensus. To recognize 
and respect the intrinsic, intrinsic value of nature implies the acceptance of boundaries of human interests. In analogy to the categorical imperative of Kant, one can say, as humans, also fellow creatures, must not be used as mere mean for human interests, they also have to be respected due to their intrinsic value. The dignity of creatures, as the Swiss constitution says, but though Whitehead and Jonas overcome the separation of being and art established on the background of natural science, the implications of concrete actions cannot immediately be derived from nature. The implementation of values in actions has to be discussed rationally. Yet like the needle of a compass, the intrinsic value of living entities and of the biosphere is a fundamental ethical orientation. Jonas' concentration on living creatures leads to another difference between both authors. For Jonas, only living entities and the biosphere as their living space have an intrinsic value. Whereas inorganic processes as constitutive elements of living processes have only a tendency to inwardness. Their value is based on their pot potentiality to develop life and inwardness. They have to be respected due to this potential, but not yet due to their intrinsic goal. In contrast to Whitehead, in contrast to Jonas, Whitehead argues that the whole range of nature, inorganic processes included, has an intrinsic value that is depend, independent, on human, independent on human interests. While Jonas develops the arguments for an intrinsic value of creatures, and its implications for bioethics more in detail, Whitehead distinguishes more explicitly three dimensions of ethical values in nature. First, <clears throat> every entity that is alive is striving for self-preservation and self-fulfillment, and that means it aims toward itself and has a goal in itself. Secondly, every organism <clears throat> is due to the process of self-transcendence related to other organisms and therefore a necessary condition for their process. In spite of their intrinsic value, they also have a functional value for others. The interconnectedness of all organisms implies that each of them can strive for well-being only in taking in account the well-being of others. Thirdly, Every organism has a value for nature as a whole. It is constituted by the self-transcendence of every organism and implies therefore an intrinsic and a functional value. Nature itself is at once mean and end in itself. Consequently, the re relationality of every entity and its self-centeredness does not lead to a relativity of reverence systems and values. Values are by no means only subjective. Organisms are not only striving for the fulfillment for their own um, well-being. Because the identity of an organism is based on the relation to otherness, the intrinsic value of other organisms becomes part of the intrinsic value of one's own self. Every organism develops its identity only by means of the activity of a variety of other organisms, and they, for their part, do the same. The annihilation of an organism therefore causes a reaction on the agent. Its identity is influenced in a process of feedback by its own deeds. The concept of organism implies as Whitehead argues convincingly, the solidarity of the universe. The struggle for survival cannot be based only on the fight against others and on permanent competition. It is also grounded in manifold forms of cooperation. An observation modern ecology confirms. In contrast to the ethics of Whitehead, that is, due to the inclusion of inorganic processes tending to a physiocentrism or holism, 
the ethics of Jonas tends to a bio biocentrism focused on living creatures and their environment. And whereas Whitehead justifies the value of all entities by means of an all-embracing system of categories, Jonas develops the implications of bioethics, especially for humans, on the background of modern medical technology. Whitehead, in turn, establishes the basis for an aesthetic, eth aesthetics of nature, which is completely absent in the philosophy of Jonas. Yet both authors conceive humans as a unity of body and mind who are rooted in nature as an evolutionary process. The acknowledgement of the common ground of all creatures leads to an ontology of participation and an ethics based on values that transcend human interests and goals. Therefore, humans are not, as Pascal, Heidegger and Sartre believed, thrown into a completely meaningless world. Jonas and White had again agree that the philosophy of nature, based on the concept of life and its intrinsic value, overcomes the nihilism of the 20th century. This nihilism is, as Jonas argues, the unavoidable consequence of the separation of matter and mind and the exclusion of subjectivity by the method of modern science and its claim to absoluteness. Both authors therefore ask for absolute being as the ultimate ground of the process of nature and of history. Yet as philosophers of the 20th century, neither Jonas nor White had start their analysis from the perspective of absolute being. Nevertheless, the interpretation of the process of evolution leads to the question about absolute being as a ground of creativity and of the final meaning of history. While Whitehead focuses on the process of evolution, Jonas is wrestling with the ethical evil in the world, symbolized by Auschwitz. The concept of freedom, so runs the argument, can only be taken seriously if the attribute of almightiness of God is dismissed. Only then God cannot be blamed for the ethical evil in the world. Humans themselves contribute to the face of the universe that crystallizes in the long process of evolution. God participates in this evolutionary process that is by no means predetermined. In accordance with Whitehead, Jonas stresses that God himself depends on the historical process and that means that he is becoming and participating in the world process. Yet in contrast to Whitehead, Jonas explicitly reflects on the problem of the ethical evil and its relation to the genuine human dimension of freedom with, with its implication for moral depth and resp responsibility. Let me summarize. Though there, is, uh, though there is an astonishing correspondence between Whitehead and Jonas concerning the concept of organism as defined by the process of self-transcendence, the difference in detail, in detail is also striking. Jonas, who stresses the difference between inorganic and organic entities, can elaborate the dimension of inner identity and its existential and ethical meaning more precisely. Yet the evolutionary gap between inorganic and organic structures remains unsolved. An all-embracing system of categories that Whitehead has developed in process and reality therefore points into the right direction. Nevertheless, Whitehead himself has possibly felt the deficiency of the system of categories in respect to the problem of life and in 1933-34 dedicated explicitly two lectures to this special problem. Nevertheless, for both authors, the concept of self-transcendence is the basis for an ethics that is able to overcome subjectivism and nihilism. Thank you.